This is not a waste of time. It's not a waste of time. We're so thankful. We're so thankful. To the King Unison. To the King Eternal Immortal.
all our hands are up. Jesus, we do give you glory. We do give you honor. We're so grateful for all that you have done. And we take it. We take it, we take it, we take it. All that you have purchased. We thank you for your blood, the price of purchase. We thank you for it. And everybody said, what about last night? Just what about it? I know he could get up here and all he has to do, all he has to do when he gets up here and say, that's what I do. That's just what I do. Um, one of the things that I so value about Brother Jerry Savelle's ministry and the skill, I watch him. He takes one truth and he drives it and he from this angle from that angle from and you don't walk out going I'm not sure what he was trying to impart to us it is so skillful that he has cleared away all the underbrush I mean and he just hones in on that and that way everyone can walk out saying I know what God had for me today that skill Amen. No one walks out scratching their head and saying, I'm not, I'm not clear. Amen. Skill puts handles on it for people so they can grab it. And so I want you to give Dr. Jerry Savelle a great big God bless you as he comes this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Everybody doing well? Yes. Rest well? Yes. Ready to receive? Yes. All right, praise God. We're in the right place. Yes. Shake hands with two or three people and tell them I'm glad you're here today. Thank you once again, Nancy, for inviting us to come. I have already been thoroughly blessed and uh, looking forward to having the opportunity to impart into you this morning. So get ready. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles, first of all, to the book of Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8. And while you're turning there, let me ask you this. Why would you settle for bones when you can have steak? <laughs> Amen. Anybody like steak? Anybody prefer bones? No, let's go for the steak, praise God. Let's go for God's best, the maximum, the highest level attainable. It's amazing to me how that some Christians will settle for less than God's best. There's a story in the book of Exodus that I know you're all familiar with. It has to do with Pharaoh and Moses. And it says in verse 8, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go. Moses said, when shall I entreat my God to remove the frogs? Pharaoh said, tomorrow. Tomorrow. I heard Brother Copeland preach on this way back in 1969. And he said, give me one more night with them frogs. Why would you want one more night with the frogs? Frogs in your bed, frogs in your oven, frogs in your dough, green frogs, brown frogs, yellow frog, 
ugly frogs, big frogs, little frogs, and you want one more night with them? That doesn't make good sense. But that's the way a lot of Christians are. Give me one more night with this. I remember uh, when I was working with Brother Copeland as an employee, we were in a meeting and uh, this lady came up for prayer and uh, she said, uh, Brother Copeland said, what would you like for me to pray for you about? Pray with you about? She said, um, well, uh, I've got this one problem, but I can live with that. I just want you to pray with this. Oh, what would you want to live with it? Why, why put up with it if you can be set free? But that's the way a lot of Christians think. You know, they'll, they'll take something less than God's best. Sometimes even, even financially. You know, I, I wouldn't want to break heaven by asking God for this. I remember when I first came to the Lord, I didn't know anything. And uh, like Brother Copeland said, he was scripturally illiterate. I was the same way, didn't know anything. And I, I grew up in a Christian home. My, my mom and dad, uh, they were Christian people. They didn't know the word like we know it today. And we had a little, we were country people, a little country Baptist church down the end of our road. And that's where we went. And uh, uh, I, I never heard our pastor say anything about you know, being blessed with the blessings of Abraham. Never heard anything about redeemed from the curse. Uh, never heard anything about walking in the favor of God. I never heard anything like that. All I ever heard that I remember, and I'm, 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 uh, it could be that he did preach on those things. I wasn't a good listener, but I don't think he did. I don't remember we ever hearing him talk about those things, but I do remember there's none worthy, no, not one. Yeah. <laughs> Has anybody ever been Baptist at least one time? <laughs> then you probably heard that in your Baptist church. There's none worthy, no, not one. Yeah. Our sin is, as, our, our righteousness is as filthy rags. We heard that nearly every week, you know. And um, so I remember when, when uh, I came to the Lord, and began to get into the Word. And of course, I, I started with the help of Kenneth Copeland had reel-to-reel -reel tapes back then. Anybody remember reel-to-reel? -reel? <laughs> and uh, so there was a message on both sides. And he was there at the church that my wife grew up in. And, uh, and then I later started attending after I came to the Lord. And uh, there was a lady in the church that recorded all of the messages that Brother Copeland preached that week, three services a day. And uh, after he left town, she came to my house with a grocery sack full of these reel-to-reel -reel tapes and said, Jerry, um, she was one of, my, uh, one of the prayer partners with my wife. They'd been praying for me. In fact, my wife had the entire youth department fasting for my salvation. <laughs> they like to starve to death, but thank God I finally came around, you know. <laughs> And uh, so this lady was one of Carolyn's prayer partners. They always gathered up at somebody's house and prayed. And I was on the list. And so uh, uh, she came over and she said, Jerry, God told me to bring you this. And if you'll listen to them, they'll change your life. Amen. I said, what is it? She opened that bag and it was full of those reel-to-reel -reel tapes from the services, 21 messages, you know, from the services that he'd preached that week. And I said, well, how am I supposed to listen to these? She said, don't you have a tape, re tape player? I said, no. She said, well, I'll be right back. She went home, came back, brought this tape player that was about this big. And then it had two speakers that you attached to the side of it. And, you know, you didn't carry it around like a Sony Walkman, you know. It was huge. You set it on a, set it on a table. And she said, now, start with that first tape and go all the way through them. And if you listen to them closely, they'll change your life. Yeah. And so that's how I began. Yeah. And uh, I had shut my automotive business down uh, a few months later and started listening to those tapes. The Lord told me, he said, if you'll give me the same dedication that you gave that business in three months, I'll make a minister out of you. Wow. And so I, I was very dedicated to my business. 
if I had to work all night, didn't bother me at all. If I had to work 12, 15, 17 hours a day, didn't bother me at all. I wanted to be successful if that's what it took. That's, I, I, my dad raised me with a good work ethic, you know. Only two scriptures my dad ever gave me when I was growing up. He said, a boy that don't eat, don't, don't work, don't eat. He said that was in the Bible. I believed him. I liked eating, so I went to work. And then uh, after I married, my, my father gave me this verse. He said, a, a man that won't take care of his family is worse than an infidel. I wasn't sure what an infidel was, but it, wasn't, it didn't sound good, so I didn't want to be one that took care of my family. So that's only two scriptures my dad ever shared with me. And uh, so I began listening to those messages, and I'd never heard anything like it. I mean, if you remember the first time you heard the word of faith and thought, I've never heard anything. Where has this been all my life, you know? And so I started listening to that verse tape, and he just simply called it the word of faith. And I listened to it over and over. And uh, uh, most of it I didn't understand. Thank God it had a stop button, had a replay button, and I could rewind and start him all over again and, uh, until I got it. And uh, so I began learning about how to, how to live by faith. Amen. And I remember the second visit that Brother Copeland came about six months after that first visit. By this time now, I'm a believer. I'm, I'm listening to his messages. I could hardly wait for him to arrive. He was going to be there for another week, three services a day. So I didn't want to miss any of them. And uh, But as it turned out, he had a wreck in his automobile on the way over there, wiped out the whole left side of this 1969 Pontiac Bonneville, and asked pastor if there was somebody in the church that did body work, if they could repair it while he was there that week. So he knew that that's what I had done. So uh, they asked me if I could repair Brother Copeland's car while he was there for the week. So I did. I didn't get to go to the day services because I was working on his car, but I went every night. And one day he came over to watch me work. Now I'd shut my shop down, but I still uh, could do the work at my home, you know. And uh, so he came over to watch me work. And so I'm, I'm grinding this quarter panel down and he's standing there like this, you know, with these piercing eyes. My goodness, I've never seen eyes like that before in my life. I thought he could read every thought I had. And some of them were not real good. You know, I, I, I couldn't look at him. I thought he could look right through me. So, and you know, and I'm, I'm just a young believer and I'm still working on getting sanctified, you know. Wasn't sure what that meant, but I heard about it. I didn't think I was there yet. And so he's standing there watching me like this. Finally, I put the grinder down. I said, Brother Copeland, you mind if I ask you some questions? He said, not at all. I said, well, I've been listening to your messages from the last meeting you were here. And it, I'm stirred up about this life of faith. And I don't know anybody else to ask these questions to. I don't know anybody knows faith like you do. So can I ask you questions about the life of faith? He said, sure. So he was very gracious and answered my questions. Then finally he said, uh, now I've got to go and get prepared for the service tonight. Are you going to be there? And I said, yes, sir, I will be. So got over to the service that night and uh, he, he started preaching and stopped. And I mentioned this last night, but he stopped and he said, Jerry, stand up. And so I stood up. He said, while I was in prayer today after I left you, God showed me that you and I would be a team. We're going to spend the rest of our lives together preaching the word of God all over the world. And he said, and it'll be your responsibility to believe God for the perfect timing for the team to begin. Sit down. And then he went on with his sermon. So I, I didn't, I was young. I didn't really understand what he was saying. And back in those days, Carolyn and the Holy Ghost, as far as I was concerned, were one and the same. You know, <laughs> she helped me interpret everything, you know. And so I said, what did that mean? She said, I think we're moving to Fort Worth. I said, why? She said, well, he said, you're going to be a team. You're going to preach the word together for the rest of your lives. I thought, well, what, a, what an honor that would be. The man that brought me the message to change my life, and now I'm going to spend the rest of my life preaching with him all over the world. And so 
uh, that, that took place a, a several months later when we moved to Fort Worth. And, and then uh, I began traveling with Brother Copeland. And back in those early days, we didn't go anywhere for one day or one night. Everywhere we went, three weeks minimum. Brother Copeland used to say, it takes a week to break through all the unbelief. The second week, they started listening to what you have to say. The third week, we have a move of God. So everywhere we went, three weeks. I'm in every service, three services a day. Some of you probably heard me say this before, but back in those days, I would open the service in prayer and then I'd turn it over to Brother Copeland. And back then, I mean, a hundred people in an evening service, that was a crowd. This is, this is 1971 or, or so, 70, 71. And uh, so then I would turn the service to him. And I'd, I had a little uh, uh, recorder on the platform. And I'd sit back behind him with this Sony recorder and uh, had these Radio Shack speakers, you know, <laughs> and amplifier. And then I would wait for my cue. And Brother Copeland might say a few words or I might even sing. Uh, I'd have to arrange to have a piano player there in every meeting. And he might sing. And back then his theme song was more about Jesus. And he'd usually sing that. And then when he got ready to preach, he'd turn like this and say, turn me on, Jerry. <laughs> that meant turn the recorder on. And then I would listen to make sure I'm getting a good recording. Then I'd put the headset down. And now that's my Bible school. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm the first graduate of Kenneth Copeland Bible School. Okay. And so now I'm listening. Man, I'm, I'm locked in. And uh, so I heard that three services a day for three weeks. Turn me on, Jerry. Turn me on, Jerry. Turn me on, Jerry. I'd just like to announce if it hadn't been for Jerry Savelle, Kenneth Copeland would have never got turned on. Amen. <laughs> so that, that's my Bible school. Everywhere we went, you know, I'm learning. Yes, sir. And, and I'm acting on applying what I've learned. So the Bible says, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Uh -huh. yeah. So Kenneth and Gloria Copeland were mine and Carolyn's examples. Yeah. We'd, we'd, hear the, we'd hear the sermons and Carolyn was raising our daughters back then. She wasn't traveling with me like that. And so she didn't get to hear Brother Copeland like I did every day. So I'd come home and I'd try to preach to her what I heard him preach so that we would be on the same level, you know. And because um, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Amen. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm learning and I'm applying and I'm watching how Kenneth and Gloria uh, apply the Word. We saw them get results. We do what they did do what the Word said, we get the same results. And so we had great examples to follow. Well, during that time, I learned from him that we could have God's best. Why settle for anything less? Why spend the night, one more night with frogs when you can be delivered today? Amen. Why not have God's best? So we begin to learn to believe for God's best. And uh, back in those days, I mean, we were, I was still believing God uh, when I first moved to Fort Worth. I still had a lot of business debts that I hadn't paid off yet. I was believing God to be able to pay those off. I went to all the people I owed, told them what had happened to me. I'm, 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 I'm born again. Uh, I'm serving God. I'm, I'm preparing for full-time ministry. I'm a man of my word. Even, even as a sinner, I was a man of my word. Yeah. And uh, uh, I told him, I said, I don't know when I'll pay you. I don't know how I'll pay you. But I promise you, I'll pay you every dime I owe you. And if you want to charge interest, that's fine. I will pay every dime I owe you. And it took a, a few months to get that done. But we got it done, praise God. Amen. 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 And so then we began believing God for everything. We needed everything. When Caroline moved to Fort Worth, I was driving an old car that had over 100,000 miles on it. It had been a total wreck when I bought it. And that's all I could afford because I'm trying to pay those business debts off. 
It was a 1964 Olds 98 luxury sedan. That luxury had left that car a long time ago. <laughs> it was just a sedan now, okay? And uh, that's what I drove to Fort Worth. It had been a total wreck. I paid $189.59 for it and rebuilt it. It was beautiful. You couldn't tell it was ever wrecked, but everything else was shot. The engine had over 100,000 miles on it. The transmission slipped. I, I learned in that car what a great man of faith Kenneth Copeland was. He'd call me sometimes, say, uh, Jerry, take me to the airport. Well, I'd get up at least two hours early, go out there and pray over that car in tongues. Because my 64 O's 98 luxury sedan would not respond to just turn the ignition on. It only responded to our in tongues, okay? I'd turn it on, I got it running, I'd leave it running. Then, then I'd go over to his house. I left it running. I didn't dare cut it off when I got to his house. Didn't know if it'd start again. And I'd get him in the car, get his luggage in the car, take him to the airport. And on the way over there one time, it's cold. Man, it's cold, January. And my heater didn't work. So Brother Copeland gets in the car. He's got on his top coat, you know, and, and he sets down and, and we take off. He said, Jerry, turn the heater on. I said, it's on. <laughs> he said, the heater's on. I said, wide open. <laughs> he said, it's cold in here. And this is the first time I ever got to say this to him. Don't be moved by what you feel. So he sat there, and it's so cold in there, you can see our breath as we're talking to each other. <laughs> He's sitting over there shaking like this, and he said, in the name of Jesus, I command this heater to work. And boy, that thing came on like to run us out of there. And I said, no, Brother Copeland, don't, don't stop using your faith now. Because we're about to make a left turn, and the transmission slips, and the traffic's coming your way. So you better believe God we're going to make it through the whole intersection, you know. So that was the condition Carol and I were in when we first moved to Fort Worth. Not only that, but, but we had junk. And I hauled that junk in a U-Haul trailer over to Fort Worth from Shreveport, Louisiana. And some of it fell out on the interstate. And I was so ashamed, I just left in the road and went on. <laughs> when we got to Fort Worth, we didn't have a stove. We didn't have a, we didn't have a refrigerator. We had hand-me-down furniture that didn't fall out of the trailer. And uh, we were in pitiful shape. But we knew for the first time in our lives we're in the perfect will of God. Amen. And we knew that we knew that it's just a matter of time with what we're learning we, our circumstances are going to drastically change. Hallelujah. Amen. Now that's where a lot of people give up. That's where a lot of people give up. They, they, they get impatient waiting for, you know, the, the better life. They get impatient. But no, we were determined because we, we heard their testimony. I mean, they were, they were as bad or worse than we were when they started. And we heard their testimony. We saw what they did. And we said, if we do what they do and we do what the word says, then we should get the same results. So why quit when we have evidence that it works? Praise God. Amen. And so we, we learned to start believing for God's best. Now, it didn't happen overnight. You know, and, and, and obviously we needed another car. So we started believing for a better car. And at that time in my life, I wasn't, I wasn't at the level with my faith that I could believe God for a new car, paid off, paid in full, cash, you know. But I believed my faith was at a level to believe for a better car than what I had, you know. And so... Uh, we started believing for a better car. 
And uh, eventually that came to pass. And it was a boost to our faith. You know, that we had a better car and it was paid for. That, that's, that's inspiring to your faith. You know, Jesus, I, I like to call it this. Uh, Jesus taught on the law of progression. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. So when that, that better car came, that was the blade. As far as we were concerned, that was the blade. Okay, so now we're going for the full corn in the ear. You know, that's, that's maximum, highest level. And over a period of time, that began to happen. And praise God, you know, I wouldn't take anything for those days and, and those experiences that we had back then. I'm glad they're over, but I wouldn't take anything for them because they were foundation years. They were laying the foundation. And now, praise God, we look back on that. I don't know how many cars I've bought for people. I don't know how many cars I've given away. I've given away nine airplanes. Uh, I, we've been able to bless people all over the world. We're debt free. Our ministry's debt free. We don't owe anybody anything, praise God. Amen. Flying the finest airplane I've ever owned in my life. Driving the finest cars I've ever owned. Don't go to bed worried. I'm living the maximum, hallelujah. But, but it didn't start that way. But you got to start somewhere and have a goal. Amen. Aim for the maximum. Can you say amen? So don't be like Pharaoh and be satisfied with another night with the frogs. If you can have steak, why go for bones? Let's go for the steak. How, how, how about it? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going for the steak. Amen. Now, let's turn to Psalm 68, if you will, please. Psalm 68. And here's a verse that I'm not sure I know a lot of Christians who really believe it. Look at verse 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. That says to me, now I'm the kind of person where my attitude from the very beginning when I came to the Lord and I started reading the Bible, my attitude was, God, if you didn't mean this, you shouldn't have put it in my copy of the book because once I find it, I'm going for it. Amen. And I, and I won't be satisfied until it happens. So notice here, blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. So that says to me, I'm to expect something from God every day. Every day. So if I, if, if I have his word that he daily loads me with benefits, why would I be satisfied to experience something from God about every other month. You know, you hear a lot of people, uh, I, I remember when I first started going to the church, Carolyn grew up in, it was a Pentecostal church. She'd been filled with the Holy Ghost since she's eight years old. And I didn't know anything about those things. When she, when she told me she was Pentecostal, I'd never even heard the word before. I said, what's a Pentecostal? You know, and... Uh, I didn't know anything. So we, when I started going to the church after I came to the Lord that she grew up in, uh, they, they would have testimonies on Sunday night, testimony service. I said, what are they going to testify to? What did they do? You know? <laughs> she said, no, it's gonna, they're going to testify about what the Lord has done. Amen. Well, okay, so I'm, I'm sitting there listening and it seemed like every testimony started out with, well, the devil visited our house this week. Everybody in our house is sick. Husband got laid off, blessed be his holy name. I didn't hear anything good. And it seemed like to me the next person was trying to one-up the other one. You think the devil visited your house? He lives at our house. And it, it was never much about what God had done, but it seemed like every time 
at the end of the testimony, they'd say, but we all know our God is able. And everybody in the church, yes, hallelujah. <laughs> so one day I, I said, Carolyn, they all say God is able. We all know God is able, but they never talk about what he did. They keep talking about what the devil's doing. I said, I'm going to ask some of them sometimes, did God do what you said he could do? And she'd always say, don't embarrass me. I said, I'm not going to embarrass you, but, you know, inquiring minds want to know. Don't tell me our God is able and never give a testimony of what he was able to do. So one lady got up and testified, and that night after the service, I walked up to her and I said, and I started off like this. It kind of shocked her. I said, did he? She said, who? I said, God. Did he what? I said, did he do what you said he's able to do? And then her reply was, well, you never know what God's going to do. I said, no, ma'am, that's not what you said. You stood up in front of the church and said, our God is able. Well, did he? Did he do what you said he's going to do? Don't tell me we never know what God's going to do. You said our God is able. Now, I made a lot of people mad. I mean, you know, I, like Brother Hagin said, I got real close to getting the left foot of fellowship, you know. Because I, I wanted to know. I mean, this is my life. You people have been praying I'd come to God. Now you treat me like I, I got too saved. You know, what they wanted me to do is just sit there on the bench, warm the bench, don't rock the boat, don't ask many questions, just believe what we tell you. Well, I'm a boat rocker. I can't sit there. I can't sit there and just believe what you tell me. I want evidence. Amen. And I very seldom found anybody that would say, yes, God did what I said he would do. So that became my quest is to see if God really will do what he says he's going to do. And when I come across this verse, blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. I'd ask people in the church, what did God do for you today? Huh? <laughs> what did God do for you today? What benefit did you enjoy today? Well, I'm not sure that I, I experienced the benefit from God today at all. I said, well, the Bible says he daily loadeth us with benefits. Doesn't that mean you should be experiencing something from God every day? Like the first church I preached in? You know, they, they, they wouldn't let me preach on Sunday. They asked me to come on Wednesday because they knew there wouldn't be many people there and I couldn't do much damage. Okay? So... <laughs> So uh, this little Pentecostal church on the back side of the tracks, on the other side of town, brave enough to ask me to come. And uh, I noticed when I got in there, everybody sitting on the back row. <laughs> a little small church, probably didn't hold 70 people, but everybody sitting on the back row. And I thought, why are, why are they all in the back row? Well, when the pastor got up, and said a few things, I realized why they're sitting on the back row because he, he, he beat them in the head every time they came with sin, you know. Nothing, nothing positive, nothing, nothing encouraging and inspiring. They just came out of, out of habit. But, but they got tired of being beat over the head. Like Brother Hagin used to say, if you keep beating a mule over the head, he, keep coming, he won't come to the trough anymore. And so that's what was happening. And so I, I said something about, you know, isn't it wonderful that, that uh, God uh, loads us daily with benefits? Oh, you ought to see the looks I got. Yeah. And I turned to the pastor and I said, isn't it wonderful God <laughs> daily loads us with benefits? Hmm. <laughs> I thought, I don't guess anybody in here is getting anything from God daily. And they got mad at me for saying that God wants to do something for you every day of your life. Didn't, didn't, the, didn't in what we traditionally call the model prayer, Jesus say, give us our daily bread? 
Don't use the word daily if you don't mean it. Because there's a few of us that believe it. I expect God to do something daily in my life. I get up every day expecting something daily. Amen. A lot of times when I get off my airplane, I don't care where I'm at in the world, when I get off my airplane, I will say, blessings, if you're looking for Jerry Savelle, I'm in Melbourne, Australia today, come on me and overtake me, hallelujah. And before the day is up, I got a testimony of God doing something daily. Tony, Tony has traveled me all over the world and he can testify to it. But I get up expecting it. Not because I'm so good, because he's so good. Where's Heidi? Where's Heidi? Are you here this morning, Heidi? Way back there. Heidi, stand up. Heidi's been a, a very dear friend of mine for many, many years. And Heidi uh, was a costume designer in Hollywood and, and uh, led a lot of people to the Lord. Uh, Heidi would call me sometimes and say, I'm bringing somebody to your meeting tonight when I'd come out to California. And I'm, she wouldn't tell me who it was, always a surprise. Usually some celebrity or movie star or something she'd led to the Lord. And uh, I, I met... You can sit down, Heidi. I met uh, met Lark Lemon in in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. I, I had rented uh, the convention center, and the Globe Trotters were playing in the arena that was connected to the convention center. And and it's on the marquee out front. It said Globe Trotters tonight uh, in the arena, and then underneath it said Jerry Savelle Evangelistic Association in the convention center. So when I saw that sign when we got to town, I thought, the Globetrotters are here. And they're here the same night I'm here. I wanted to send a tape to my meeting and go watch the Globetrotters. Because <laughs> I remember the Globetrotters, how many of you remember when Wide World of Sports first came out? Well, that's the first time I saw the Globetrotters. I fell in love with Metal Arc Lemon. I thought he was the most amazing guy I'd ever, I'd ever seen. And uh, so... I thought, man, the Globetrotters are here. I wish my meeting started tomorrow night. But I, I, didn't, go, I didn't go to the Globetrotters. I went to my meeting, okay? <laughs> but the next morning, the, the hotel we were staying in was connected to the convention center in the arena. And so the next morning, I got up to go for breakfast, and I, I got in the, the uh, restaurant there, and there was a line of people waiting to get a table. So I just got in line. There was a tall black man standing in front of me, had his back to me, and I couldn't see his face. And I'm just standing there, and I heard over to my right somebody say, Metal Ark. I thought, Metal Ark? There's only one Metal Ark in the world. He must be in here. About that time, the guy in front of me turned around, and he looked over to the right. So I looked over to the right, and it was Curly Neal. And Curly was trying to get Metal Ark's attention to come sit with him. Well, Metal Ark went like this. And then he turned around and looked down at me. <laughs> and he reached out and I said, Metal Ark Lemon, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. He said, you brought a lot of joy to my life watching you play basketball. I said, now I just want you to know, you may not, we may never meet again, I don't know. But I just want you to know, I'm a minister from Texas and this minister is going to be praying for you. I've already been praying for you, but I'm going to keep praying for you because we could use a man like you in the body of Christ. And he tried to pull his hand away and I wouldn't let him. <laughs> I said, so I just want you to know, you may not ever remember my, my name again. I know you meet a lot of people, but this preacher is praying for you. Praise God. And so I let his hand go and he went and sat, sat next to Curly and he pointed at me. So I knew he was telling Curly what I said. Okay. <laughs> Now, sometime later, he leaves the Globetrotters and starts a new team called the Bucketeers, okay? He goes to Heidi to get her to make the uniforms for his team. She leads him to the Lord, okay? And also, uh, Heidi, Heidi would have my books in her, in her shop and others, Brother Hagen, Brother, Brother Copeland, and so forth. 
And she gave Metalark one of my books and told him to read it. And when he comes back to pick up his merchandise, she will ask him questions and make sure he read it. Okay. Now, Heidi, I may not get all this exactly, but I believe that's pretty close to the way you told it to me. And so when he came back to pick up his uniforms, she quizzed him on whether or not he read the book. And he apparently did. And he, he said, I'd like to meet this man. She said, well, he's in uh, Ventura or Oxnard, one or the other, in a meeting this week. I'll take you over to meeting. And so she called and said, I'm bringing somebody to the meeting. Can we come to the speaker's room before you go out to speak? I said, sure. She didn't tell me who it was. And so uh, she walks in with Metalark Lemon. So Metalark reaches out, shake hands with me. And he said, I read your book and I wanted to meet you. And I said, well, this is not the first time we've met. He said, really? I said, we met in Columbia, South Carolina some months ago. And I said to you that there's a preacher. And he interrupted me. He said, you the one, you the one. <laughs> I said, well, I've been praying for you, and now I see that you're born again. He said, I'm called to preach. Can you help me? I said, yes, I can help you. He said, I'm going to need a mentor. I said, well, it'd be hard for me to mentor you in Los Angeles, and I'm in Fort Worth. He said, I'll move to Fort Worth. <laughs> Madlark Lemon came and lived with our family, lived in my home for a year, and traveled with me, and I mentored him. Okay? Now... Metal art, metal art, one of the most precious men I've ever known in my life. I loved him dearly. I miss him dearly. And, uh, and he, he was such a blessing to our family. We loved metal art. He loved our family. And uh, he called Jerry Ann, his little sister. He called me dad. And sometimes I, on meetings with me, uh, I, I'd say that I'd like to introduce metal art lemon and he'd call me dad. In fact, when he was in the hospital before he went home to be with the Lord, he'd moved to Phoenix and I went out to be with him uh, during his surgery. And when, when I walked in the hospital room, his room, the doctor was prepping him for surgery. Medlark saw me walk in and he said, Dad. The doctor turned around and said, Dad? <laughs> Medlark said, That's my dad. And the doctor turned around and said, I can see a little resemblance. <laughs> So anyway, over the years, Metal Ark blessed me with memorabilia from the Globetrotters. But Heidi came last night. Now I'm talking about daily benefits. God doing something for you daily. I, I call him the God of surprises. It doesn't surprise me that he blesses me every day. It always surprises me at how he goes about it and who he uses to do it. That's always a surprise. It doesn't surprise me. I expect in some way before the sun goes down, benefits coming to me. Daily benefits. Daily benefits. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know who he's going to use to do it. But I know that something good is going to happen to me. Hallelujah. Okay. So Heidi comes to the meeting last night and she called her office and let us know that she would be here. So she comes back in the speaker's room after the service last night and brings me Metal Ark Lemon's original uniform when he played for the Globetrotters. <laughs> the original uniform. He gave it to her and told her, hold on to it because one day this will be valuable. I call that a benefit. Yeah. <laughs> and I hadn't been in, where am I? What, what town am I in today? Marietta. Marietta. Marietta, yeah. I knew I was in California, I forgot the town. Marietta. 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 Yes, hadn't, sir. Hadn't been here a whole 24 hours. <laughs> huh? Happens to me everywhere I go. Look at your neighbor and say, me too. Happens to me everywhere I go. 
Why shouldn't it happen to you everywhere you go? Everywhere you go is another day, and another day means another benefit. I'm talking about the maximum lifestyle. Why settle for benefits occasionally when you can have them every day? Look at your neighbor and say, I can have benefits from God every day. And if you believe it, give the Lord a good shout of praise. Amen. Every day. Every day, every day. Hallelujah. We were, we were flying to Africa back in, what was that? Was that February, March, early March? Latter end of February, I think. So we're flying to Africa. I was going to Johannesburg to begin with and then Ethiopia. And uh, we're flying our, our Falcon. And we were, oh, we were just having a glorious time. We, we, were, we were sailing along there at 44,000 feet. We had some tailwinds. We were doing 670 miles an hour. I am waving at American Airlines below us. <laughs> we were arriving at our, at our scheduled stops at least an hour in advance of what our original uh, ETA was. And, and I was just having a blast. I mean, I, I can hardly sit down in my airplane. So I believed for this airplane for 20 years. I sold, I sold other airplanes for this airplane for 20 years. And, uh, and now I'm flying it. And, and I can hardly sit down at it. I, I, I just walk the cabin and shout and praise God. And my chief pilot, he'll come back there every once in a while and he'll say, Brother Jerry, if you think riding this airplane is fun, you ought to come fly it. He said, this is the finest airplane I've ever flown in my life. And I said, you do get back up there and keep flying. I'm going <laughs> to... I'll praise God for both of us back here, okay? So I just, I just walk the cabin and shout and praise God. Sometimes, and sometimes I cry just over the goodness of God. I mean, you have to understand, folks, I was a country bumpkin. I was born in the sticks of Mississippi on a farm that my grandfather bought in 1927. It's where my dad was raised. It's where I was born. And we were certainly not middle class. We weren't even close to middle class. My dad was called white trash when he was growing up going to school because he's so poor. That's where I was born on that farm. And, and, and because my grandfather had cattle, he had hogs, had chickens, he had crops, we were pretty much self-contained. And it was because of, of, of being able to sell crops at the market. That's how my grandfather got through the Depression. Is, is how, that's how he was able to, you know, keep the family uh, with bread on the table. And then when I came along, you know, not, not a whole lot had changed. We lived in a house. They called it, it was like a shotgun house. You could stand at the front door and look all the way through the house to the back door. We didn't have any indoor plumbing. We had, a, we had an outhouse. Some of y'all looking like Come on. <laughs> so sophisticated. <laughs> if you went to the bathroom, you went to the outhouse. Right. Right. I hated going to the outhouse because yeah, it was in the chicken yard. And my grandfather had a rooster that would attack me every time I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> That crazy rooster jump on my shoulder and just peg my head. I went in the house one day and got my grandpa's 22 rifle and shot that rooster, put him out of his misery. My grandpa said, son, you shot my rooster. I said, he won't be pecking my head no more. I'm out there in the outhouse one time and a snake crawled in there. I jumped off of that thing and jumped outside ran to the house and, and got me a, a stick and some matches and set it on fire, threw some gas in there, and I burnt that snake up and the outhouse. <laughs> Grandpa said, son, you burned the outhouse down. I said, yeah, I killed that snake, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> That's the way I grew up, yes, okay? <laughs> 
And my grandfather, uh, we finally didn't get, now I had moved, to, we had moved to Louisiana by this time, but I'd spend my summers on the farm in, in Mississippi. And my grandfather finally built another house. Wasn't, it was still another shotgun house, but he had indoor plumbing in it. Okay? We didn't have to go to the outhouse anymore. But we still had a, a well outside. And the first well we had, it had a bucket on it with a rope and you drop it down in there and you crank it up, you know. And then by the time he built this house in 57, he, he had a, 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 a pump, a pump. And, and you, you kept a, a cup of water out there to prime the pump. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So you prime, he said, son, don't ever, don't ever use up that water. Always keep a cup of water there to prime the pump. And so you'd pump and get the water and bring it in the house, you know. And, and that's the way I grew up. Okay. And it wasn't until my dad moved us to Shreveport, Louisiana. And the only reason we moved to Shreveport, my dad thought Jesus was going to set up his throne in Vicksburg, Mississippi when he came back. And the only reason my dad finally moved us away from the farm is because he had a friend that he grew up with who moved to Shreveport, and he was a mechanic. And he called my dad and said, J.W., you can, you can get a better job making better money in Shreveport than you can in Vicksburg. So dad went and applied for this job at, at, at the Ford Motor, Motor Dealership. And dad was making uh, $38 a week at the Studebaker dealership in Vicksburg. And when he got to Shreveport, he could make $45 a week. Okay? Yep. So that's the only reason we moved to Shreveport. Well, I thought. But God was maneuvering. I didn't know God was directing my dad's steps. His dad would have never left Mississippi. But his friend talked him into moving and he made a little bit better money. And then over a period of time, our, our, our life progressed, you know, and, and we weren't poor like we were in Vicksburg and certainly not rich, but dad saw to it. We had food on the table and my sister and I had clothes on our back and, and life was better. Well, as it turned out, we eventually moved on the street that Carolyn lived on. Her mom and dad lived there. Okay? So now we're, we're on, on this street, and the day we moved, on, moved in, when they unloaded my bicycle, I took off down the road to check out the new neighborhood. And Carolyn and her sister, which I didn't know, it's, it's my first day in that new neighborhood. They were out in the front yard playing. And I didn't know this, but when I got down at the end of the road, I turned around and come back, and I just waved at them when I, when I started back. I didn't know until years later that Carolyn went in the house that, that, that moment and told her mother, I just saw the boy I'm going to marry. We're going we're gonna to preach the gospel, and we're going to Africa. Now, if she'd have told me that when we'd grown up, I'd have never spoke to her again. <laughs> She didn't tell me that until the night before our wedding. She said, Jerry, I just want you to know I made a vow to God that the man I marry will be born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, preach the gospel, and go to Africa. I said, you're marrying the wrong man. I'm not doing any of that. She said, you don't know the power of intercessory prayer. I said, I never even heard of it. She said, that doesn't matter. All you got to do is go in there tomorrow night when the preacher says, do you take this woman? You say, I do, and me and God will take care of the rest. Well, I knew I loved her and I knew I wanted to marry her, but, but I would try to prove to her for the next three years that would never happen. I ain't going to Africa. I'm not preaching the gospel. And this Holy Ghost business, you can have it, but leave me alone. If you marry me, I told her, you're going to spend the rest of your life on a racetrack. I'm going to race automobiles. And so did you notice every time you turn on the NASCAR, Daytona 500, you never hear Jerry Svell's name? <laughs> You watch the Indy 500, you never say, and there comes Jerry Savelle. <laughs> Intercessory prayer works. <laughs> now, I was racing automobiles, but I never got to that level because yes. intercessory prayer works. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. So, 
Once again, that's when Brother Copeland showed up and I surrendered my life, surrendered my life to the Lord. So we began learning that we could have God's best. We didn't have to settle for less. Amen. Amen. So back to this trip to Africa, uh, we're flying there and we get all the way to Nairobi, Kenya. And we were just going to stop to refuel and then fly on to Joburg. So we refueled, got back in the airplane and took off and we got up about 10,000 feet. And I, I have, a, I have a, a monitor by my seat, uh, an air show that, that shows our direction and, and so forth and, and destination and altitude and speed and all that. So I'm watching and the little airplane starts making a, a U-turn. So I know we're turning around going back to Nairobi for some reason. Well, I'm not going to ask the pilots because they've got their hands full up there. This is a three-engine jet. And it, you, know, you don't want to interfere with the pilots when there is a possibly an emergency. So I'm sitting there and watching. And then we, we land in Nairobi. And so then they come back and tell me that our number three engine, we lost uh, oil pressure. And so they shut that engine down and landed. Now, on a, on a Falcon... Because it has three engines, you can safely fly on two engines, you can land on two engines, and you can take off on two engines, okay? But where we were in Nairobi, before we get to Joburg, there are two other nations in between there that were very volatile at the time, and we went, didn't want to take the chance of having another problem and have to land in a nation that might confiscate my airplane, yeah. okay? So... Uh, we, when we landed in Nairobi, we asked somebody to bring us a step ladder so we could take the cowling off of that engine and see if we could tell what kind of damage had taken place. Well, when we opened the cowling, uh, the, the, the oil pump had blown apart. I mean, they're, they're, it had blown, it had shattered, and some metal got in that engine and destroyed the engine. Okay? So now... Uh, we got to get a loaner engine before we can fly because once again, I don't want to fly over those nations. And at the, at, on two engine, you can only get up to 28,000 feet anyway. Okay. And at this time of the year, there's a lot of thunderstorms in that part of the country. So we don't want to get caught in that. So uh, me and my other passengers, we had to catch a commercial flight from Nairobi to Joburg because I'm starting a meeting that night. And then I left the pilots there in Nairobi to, to take care of getting a replacement engine. So anyway, the engine had to come from San Diego. So they, they crated up an engine and flew it to Nairobi. And a lot of things happened in between that with customs and all that. So they finally got the engine to Nairobi. But it, Nairobi does not have a Falcon service center. Joburg does. So then once we got the engine to Nairobi, we had to fly three mechanics from Joburg to Nairobi to take the engine off and crate it and send it back to Houston to have it overhauled and then put the loaner engine from San Diego on the plane. And so uh, then they were able to fly back to Joburg and, and, and do some inspections and so forth and get those mechanics back. And so my, my airplane was out of commission for a while and I'm still touring Africa. So I'm having to fly a commercial and so forth. And then I left Africa and I went to the UK and now I'm, I'm, I'm preaching all over England. I'm preaching in Ireland and I'm preaching in France. And by the time I was in France, they got the engine installed. They got all the, the uh, tests done and they pick me up in France and fly me home, okay? Now, the reason I'm telling you this is this. It cost $1.5 million per engine on a Falcon to have them re rebuilt, overhauled, okay? $1.5 million, okay? Then, to get that loaner engine from San Diego, the cost of that is another several hundred thousand dollars. Right. Then having those mechanics fly up there 
and install it and so forth. That's money. And then uh, all the commercial flights we had to do while the plane was down, that's money. So, so far, it's costing me in the natural about $2.5 million that I had not planned on. Okay? But God. But God, who daily loadeth me with benefits. Now, my insurance on my airplane, and it's the same company I've used on every airplane I've owned over the years, Haltom Hall there in Fort Worth, the insurance covered most of it. Uh, JSSI, which is an organization that we invest in monthly so that when we do have to overhaul engines, we don't have to come up with a lump sum. They apply it to the overhaul. So we had money invested in that. So they're going to cover a portion of it. And then the manufacture of the engine, because it was their engine and it was a, a, a faulty oil pump so that's what caused the problem in the first place. So my insurance company, JSSI, and the manufacturer of the engine, they stepped to the plate, and it did not cost me one dime for any of this, praise God. Amen. Not only that, they paid for all my commercial flights. They covered everything. They covered everything. Now, why would I be satisfied? Well, if they'll just cover a portion of it. Why be satisfied with a portion when you can have maximum? Amen? See, that's what I'm talking about. So many times we just settle for whatever crumbs we can get. Remember that Syrophoenician woman said to Jesus, even the dogs have the crumbs? No, why settle for crumbs when you can have the buffet? Yeah. Yeah. Folks, what I'm trying to get you to do is go for the maximum. Yeah. Go for the maximum. Yeah. Go for the highest level attainable. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord another shout of praise. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. How's my time doing? I still got some time here. Okay, all right. Now, I want to show you in my closing time here, I want to show you three specific things Jesus spoke about regarding the maximum and the highest level attainable. Are you ready? Yes. Number one, what God's word is capable of producing in your life. What God's word is capable of of producing in your life. Now go with me to Mark chapter 4. And beginning in verse 14. The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they Likewise, that which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Now, verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. Hundredfold always represents maximum. Yes. You won't find anywhere in the Bible where it talks about any higher level than hundredfold. Yes. Amen. Okay? Now, there is a verse in the Old Testament 
where God told the children of Israel that he was going to increase them a thousand times. But that was talking about people, in people, number of people. He was going to increase their, 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 their uh, families by a thousand. Okay? I got a letter from Oral Roberts one time. I'd, I'd sent him a, an offering to help on a project he was involved in. Sent a, a very generous offering. And he wrote back to me and said, Dear Jerry, thank you for being my partner. And he said, And I'm believing for you a thousand fold return. I thought, nobody but Oral Roberts believes for a thousand fold. Everybody else trying to get a hundred fold. You know? I said, Well, if he's going to believe for it with me, I'm going to agree with him. Praise God. Amen. But notice here, if you look in your Bible, you won't find any higher level than hundredfold. So hundredfold represents maximum. Would you agree to that? Now, Jesus is talking about what the word is capable of producing in a person's life. When you're good ground and you hear the word and you receive it and obviously you apply it, be a doer of the word, you have the potential of experiencing a hundredfold maximum results. Are you still with me? So that's the reason I say that one of the things that Jesus specifically said that we are capable of experiencing a hundredfold is what God's word is capable of doing in our lives. Okay? Hundredfold. Amen. Now, once again, if the word is capable of producing hundredfold, why settle for thirtyfold? Let me give you this illustration. If, if I put 30 $10 bills right here on this platform, this podium, then I put 60 $10 bills on this podium, and then I put 100 $10 bills and tell you, you are entitled to choose whichever you desire. Why would you pick the 30? Yes. That is so good. Why would you pick the 30 when, you, when you're capable of having the, the one with $110 bills? But here's how religious people think. I'm not worthy. I'll take the 30. Well, just get out of my way for I'm going for the hundred. Amen. Amen. Brother Copeland said one time, said, some of you people are waiting for this heavenly banquet. And it's not a heavenly banquet. Not Psalm 23. I will prepare a banquet for you in the presence of your enemies. Your enemy is not going to heaven. You have heard the devil's not going? So why would you put off this banquet until you get to heaven when you can have it here in the earth? Hallelujah. See, once again, people settling for less than God's best, having the bones instead of the steak. Amen. Hundredfold is symbolic of maximum. And the word of God in your life is capable of producing maximum results. Amen. Now, number two, what faith is capable of producing. We talked about this pretty much in detail last night, but I want to look at a couple other scriptures here. Talking about faith being capable of producing maximum results. Go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. Don't you love the word of God? Can't get enough of it. Verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place 
and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Amen. Nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. That's talking about maximum results. Now, I wrote down this for the word, or the definition for the word nothing. No part, no portion, no degree, no condition, no circumstances shall be impossible unto you. Nothing. No part, no portion, no degree, no condition, no circumstances shall be impossible unto you. Meaning, your faith is capable of producing maximum results. When nothing is impossible to you? Nothing. Everybody say nothing. Now, you may not be at that level, but you can get there. Just like I said earlier, you know, when we first started, my faith was not at the level where I could believe for a brand new car paid in full, but I could believe for a better car, a, a, a better car that, that, you know, didn't cost as much as a brand new car. In fact, there was a man called me one day, right at this time. He said, Jerry, I've got a car I'm, I'm planning on selling, and I'd like to give you the opportunity to buy it because I know you're believing for a car. Amen. I said, well, what do you want for it, sir? He said, well, it's a nice car, low mileage, and it was only a couple of years old, and he told me the price for it, and, and it was a good price, and I knew that he was, he was lowering the price for me, but I didn't have the money to pay for it. I said, well, sir, I appreciate that, and uh, I said, but I don't borrow money and, and I'm, I'm believing God to be able to buy a car and pay cash for it. I said, and I don't have that kind of cash right now. He said, well, I'll believe with you for it. I said, okay, praise God, I appreciate that. He said, I, I believe this is your car. I said, well, I appreciate that. I said, as soon as I, the Lord arranges for me to have the cash, I'll come get it. So I'm believing for it. I, I sowed what seed I had toward it because... I know that there's no such thing as a harvest without sowing That's seed. Right. Yes, sir. I was born on a farm, okay? <laughs> and so uh, uh, it's about a month went by. And he called me. He said, have you got the money for it yet? And I said, no, sir, not all of it. He said, uh, well, I really need to sell this car. I said, well, you, you do whatever you feel you need to do. Yes, sir. I said, but I don't borrow money, and, uh, and I don't have the cash for it. So he said, well, I, I'm probably going to have to sell it. So when I got off the phone with him, it was, it was disappointing. Sure. It, 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 I, I could feel discouragement trying to rise up. You ever been there? Oh, yeah. Okay. And so uh, I told Carolyn, I said, uh, the man's going to sell the car. She said, why? I said, well, he said he needed the money and, and he couldn't wait any longer for us to come up with the cash. And I said, uh, uh, it's disappointing, but I understand. So we'll just believe that something else is available. Sure. And about that time, the Lord said, a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. I said, Lord, didn't you hear the conversation? He's going to sell the car. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Yeah. I said, Lord, you don't understand. He said he's got to sell the car. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Yeah. Come on. Let not that man expect to receive anything from God. I said, Lord, are you telling me that I'm supposed to keep believing for this car even though the man said he's going to sell it? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. <laughs> You're not going to change God. He got a one-track mind. I said, Carolyn, I'm not giving up on that car. Even if he sells it, whoever buys it, they're going to find out it's not their car and they're going to take it back to him or whatever and I'm going to wind up with that car. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not releasing my faith on it. The next day he called and he said, Jerry, I need to apologize to you. I said, for what? He said, God got all over me after I got off the phone with you. He said, that's Jerry Savelle's car. You know it is, and you better do everything you can do to help him get it. 
He said, this is your car. Come get it. I said, no, sir, not until I have the cash for it. He said, I know God's going to give you the money. Just come get it. I said, no, sir, not until I have the cash to pay for it. He said, okay. Well, I got invited to preach in a little church in Arkansas. And I'm driving this old sedan. <laughs> Luxury's gone a long time ago, okay? I, I, need, I need four tires on this car. The tires are so thin, you can see the air in them, okay? <laughs> and I got to drive this to Arkansas. And I got, I got my babies with me, you know? They're, they're real young and we're going to drive this old dog car to Arkansas. And so I get ready to, you know, to go. And he calls me and he said, Jerry, are you going to drive that car, that Oldsmobile to Arkansas? I said, yes, sir. He said, I wouldn't be able to sleep if I knew you was out there on that highway with your family in that car. Come and get this car. At least come and get it and take it to Arkansas. Then you can bring it back to me and and." Well, and you keep yeah. believing for the yeah. money. Yes. Yeah. I said, are you sure? He said, yes. I would not be able to sleep knowing you was in that car. <laughs> so we went and got the car. Oh, man, we're sitting up here in this nice car. <laughs> Hallelujah. We can do over 50. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> <laughs> the heater works. The radio works. Everything works. Oh, man. And we're driving along there. And we're playing Andre Crouch in the, in the eight track. Uh, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I've learned to trust in God. Okay. So we go do this meeting and then we come back and I'm taking the car back to him. And he comes, he comes to the door. He sees me drive up and he comes to the door and he has something in his hand. He says, uh, here. I said, what is it? He said, the title to the car. He said, somebody come in here and paid that car off for you while you were in Arkansas. It's yours, hallelujah. Amen. Now, once again, that's inspiring to your faith. See, see, when, when you see it work, then you, then you start thinking another level and then another level and then another level. Amen. The next thing you know, praise God, you're paying cash for your cars. You're paying cash for cars for other people. That, that, that's a long ways from, you know, where we started. Amen. And everybody in here is capable of doing it, and I'm sure many of you already are. But don't settle for bones when you can have steak. Hallelujah. So notice here, nothing shall be impossible unto you. No part no portion, no degree, no condition, no circumstances shall be impossible unto you. That's maximum results. And then in Mark chapter five, go there with me very quickly. You're very familiar with this story. Little woman with the issue of blood, verse 34. And he said unto her, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Thy faith hath made thee whole. W-H-O-L-E. Whole represents maximum. Because the word whole means uh, sound through and through. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Completely, totally, altogether. Amen. If you've been made whole, then you have reached maximum where your health is concerned. This woman was made whole. Amen. She was made whole. And what caused it? Her faith had made her whole. So Jesus is explaining to us here, first of all, that the word is capable, the word in you is capable of producing maximum results. Your faith is capable of producing maximum results. Are you still with me? Now, Let's, um, uh, well, let me, let me share this with you in the final part of that. In the message translation, it says, Jesus said to her, live well and live blessed. 
Live well and live blessed. Look at your neighbor and say, isn't it wonderful? Living the maximum lifestyle. Living well and living blessed. And give the Lord praise for it. Amen. Hallelujah. Living well and living blessed. You know, I, I've, I told the testimony last night about that stroke. And since then, I've been able to pray for a lot of stroke victims and see a lot of, a lot of results. Amen. Now, in the natural, there is no evidence I ever had a stroke. No evidence I ever had a stroke. Except one thing, and and I'm, I'm I just consider it a token of my covenant. Okay. Now, how many of you have heard me tell the story about my youngest daughter Terry having her fingers cut off when she was just what thir- eighteen months old? Okay, and it was impossible. They it cut got right here behind the, the first joint, and the medical doctors said it's impossible for them to ever be normal again but God and we had a miracle and and when the doctor cut the bandages off uh, the fingers the nails were completely back and the only way that you could ever tell that she'd ever had her fingers cut off right under the nails is a little tiny scar if you if she showed you her fingers there's a little tiny scar under the nails but that's the only way that the normal length, everything. Okay? That's the only way you could ever tell that she had her fingers cut off. And I call that a token of my covenant. Okay? You remember in the Old Testament, the token of the covenant was circumcision. Okay? So, uh, uh, and back in those early days, when we were believing God for what we thought were impossible things, sometimes I'd go in there and get Terry, and I'd say, Terry, can I borrow your fingers? And I just hold him up and I say, devil, look at this. You said this was impossible. Look, don't run off yet, devil. I'm not through with you. Look, look what God did. I've, I've won a lot of victories over her fingers. Okay. Now, the only way that you could ever tell that I ever had a stroke. Can anybody detect physically any way that I've ever had a stroke? Not in my speech, not in my memory, not in my walk. The only thing is that thumb. It won't close. I have to force it to close. Look, it just... Now, the good part is, if my car ever breaks down, I can hitchhike, (laughs) praise God. (laughs) but I got to go this way. <laughs> that thumb won't lay down. Look at it. It won't do like this one. Now, most people never notice it. And then most people would not even know if I hadn't said it. But every once in a while, I'll just look down at that thumb. I'd say, if God could deliver me of a stroke and I have evidence of it and this is the token of my covenant then what else is he capable of doing praise God amen hallelujah don't you wish you had a thumb like mine (laughs) that's the funniest thing I can't can't get it to lay down it just pops back open it's reminding me of the hundredfold maximum Hallelujah. All right, now, the third thing that, that Jesus specifically talked about concerning the maximum was the sowing of seed. Your sowing is capable of producing maximum. Go to Mark chapter 10. And without taking the time to read all of this, let me just tell you the story. You're familiar with it anyway. A rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Jesus said to him, you know the commandments. He said, yes, I've kept them all from my youth. That's the reason why he was a wealthy man. And so Jesus said, but there's one thing you lack. Sell what you have and give to the poor. The Bible says the man walked away grieved at that saying because he had great possessions. Well, you could say in reality his great possessions had him. Because if you can't give away something God's blessed you with, you don't have it, it has you. And I made the commitment many, many years ago, no matter what God blessed me with, it was always available to him. In fact, I, I, have, I have at times walked in my, my museum. Well, before it became a museum, it was a smaller shop. It's still a shop to me. My wife said, quit calling it a shop. It's a museum, and it is. And I've walked in my, my shop where my classic cars and motorcycles are, and I walk in there and I say, Lord, none of this means anything to me other than the fact that you bless me with it. Every, every car, every motorcycle has a testimony of the blessing of God, the favor of God. And I said, and if you'd like for me to give it away, it'll all be gone by dark because I want you to know you're still number one in my life. And there was a time when the Lord said, okay, give that motorcycle to uh, Ben Priest with the tribe of Judah. Brand new, brand new, ultra classic Harley Davidson. Had less than 500 miles on it. Uh, give this motorcycle to Bear Morgan. Brand new Harley Davidson Heritage Soft Tail Classic. Had less than 500 miles on it. Uh, give this to so and so and give that to so and so. I cleaned out the shop, gave everything away. Everything. My wife came home. She'd been up in uh, uh, Minnesota preaching with Lynn Hammond in a women's meeting. She came home and, and I was out in the shop just uh, kind of cleaning things up. She said, where's your motorcycles and your cars? I said, I gave them all away. Now, when my wife is serious, I'm not sweetie, honey, angel, Jerry Savelle. It's the whole name. Jerry Savelle, why did you do that? I said, because I wanted to show God that nothing he blesses me with has me. I have it. And if I have it, I can give it away. And I want God to know he's still number one in my life. She said, Jerry Savelle, God knows he's number one in your life. You quit giving things away because they come back to you in fleets. <laughs> now you're going to have to build another garage. And he did, and I did, and I got a bigger museum. Yeah. Amen. See, this man was grieved at the possibility of having to give something away. So he didn't have it, it had him. Now, Jesus then said, after this man walked away, Jesus turned to his disciples and said, how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God? Not impossible. He said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because the rich man trusts in his riches. The rich man trusts in his possessions. Now, when he said that, notice how the disciples responded. Now, you would have thought if tradition is true and the disciples were poor, then they would have turned immediately and said, boys, we got it made. We got it made. Right. We don't have anything. Right. But that's not how they responded. Right. They spoke up and said, well, who then can be saved? Uh -huh. That's not how a poor man would respond right. to what Jesus said. Right. And you got to remember, this happened just shortly after Peter, James, and John, who was in the fishing business <clears throat> with their father, had just had the best day they'd ever had in the history of that business. They caught boat sinking, net breaking loads of fish, and they walked away from it to follow Jesus. Best day they'd ever had, and they walked away from it to follow Jesus. These are not poor men. So what did they say? Who then can be saved? And then Jesus responds with this. No man has left father, mother, brethren, 
lands, whatever, for my sake are the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. That's the third thing Jesus specifically talked about where a person could experience maximum results. Number one, what the word is capable of producing in your life. Number two, what your faith is capable of producing. And number three, what your seed is capable of producing. Hundredfold. Hundredfold represents or is symbolic of maximum results. Now, there's people that struggle with hundredfold because a lot of times you'll see in other translations, it's translated hundred times. And people think, you mean if I give a $1,000 to, 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 to the gospel, God promises to give me 100,000 back. They struggle with that 100 times. Quit thinking of hundredfold as 100 times because that's going to that's going to that's going to clog your mind up. You know, you're set around multiplying uh, I gave a, I gave $10,000 what's 100 times. See, eventually you're, your mind's going to shut down on you. Just think of it as maximum. See, your mind can handle that. Your mind can handle that. Now, I, I, I've told people many times for over the years, when, when Carol and I first started, we were forced to believe for hundredfold because tenfold wouldn't help us. Because, you know, what's tenfold on a dollar? <laughs> Sometimes that's all we had to be, that's all we had to give. We'd go to church and we we. We wanted to tithe, but sometimes our tithe was not more than a dollar or two. Well, tenfold or ten times, as people would say, ten times one dollar, that's not going to pay bills off. No, sir. We were talking about thousands of dollars. Even thirtyfold wouldn't help us. Sixtyfold, uh, it would help a little, but we were forced to believe for hundredfold. And, and somebody asked me one time, said, have, have you received a hundredfold on every seed you've sown? You know how I responded? Not yet. Not yet. I'm not giving up on it. I sowed it. Jesus said I'm entitled to maximum results. So I haven't received maximum on every seed I've sown. I've received maximum on a lot of seed I've sown. But the ones I haven't received maximum yet, my attitude is, not yet. Amen. It's on its way. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why settle for less when you can have maximum? Hallelujah. Yeah. Are you still here today? Yeah. Give the Lord a shout if you are, praise God. Yeah. Amen. So Jesus says, the word in your heart is capable of producing maximum results. Your faith is capable of producing maximum results. Your seed, your sowing is capable of producing maximum results. I could have been a lawyer, I rest my case. You received this morning? Hallelujah. So stand to your feet if you will, please. And let's make this declaration of faith. Lift your right hand before God. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive your word this morning and I am determined that for the rest of my life on this earth, I will not settle for less than your best. I'm very grateful for all you've done for me up to now. But I know I haven't seen it all yet because your word says, I have not seen ear hath not heard, neither is entered into the heart of man the things that you have prepared for those that love him. So there are things out there with my name on them that are looking to find their way into my life. And I will not give up on them. You said they belong to me and I will not be satisfied until I receive them. I'm going for the maximum. No more crumbs, no more bones. I'm a steak man. I'm a steak woman. I'm going for the best. And give the Lord your best shout, hallelujah. Praise God.
Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God forevermore. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Father, I pray over every person in this meeting today and those watching my live stream. There's a lot of seed represented in this place. Seed that's been sown. And it's highly likely, highly probable, everybody that's sown seed in this building and watching by live stream are in need of maximum harvest for the things that you've called them to do, for the things that, that, that are needful and necessary for their families. So in Jesus' name, I'm setting myself in agreement. And I'm believing that before this year is up, they're gonna receive maximum results, maximum harvest on the seeds that they've sown. In fact, it's quite possible it could happen within 24 hours. Your word tells the story of the prophet standing before a group of people that in the natural it's just a matter of time and they're either going to be slaughtered or they're going to die of starvation. And the prophet spoke in your behalf and said, this time tomorrow. And within 24 hours, their situation changed. You're still capable of doing that. So I'm believing in Jesus' name that there will be testimonies within 24 hours of some major breakthroughs taking place in the lives of these people. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. When I got up this morning, my office has sent to me testimonies from just last month of people who've heard me preach this. And, and my partner services uh, head said on there, Brother Jerry, these are just testimonies from last month alone and said it is overwhelming, maximum. Said we've never received this many testimonies in this short a time of what you've been preaching happening in the lives of people. Oh, and I read every one of them. I'm telling you, they were, they were amazing. They were, they were inspiring. Well, why wouldn't God do it for you? I said, why wouldn't God do it for you? Hallelujah. I, I, see, I see testimonies being birthed today. Testimonies are being birthed today, praise God. They're springing up. They're springing up all over this crowd. Hallelujah. Isn't it amazing? One night you can go to bed wondering what you're going to do and the next morning you're up shouting because God did it. Hallelujah. I've had it happen many times. Many times, where I went to bed not really knowing how God was going to do it. I get up the next day, and within 24 hours, it was done, all over with. We had to move on to the next faith project. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift our hands and bless the Lord one more time. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now, the last thing I want to say to you is, I don't believe I go anywhere accidentally. And certainly not because I didn't have any place else to preach. I believe I'm here by divine appointment. Thank you, Nancy, for obeying God and with what he told you about having me here. Thank you. So I believe I'm here by divine appointment. She quoted last night and I, I, I talk about it nearly every service I'm in. Paul said in writing to the church in Rome, I long to come to you that I might impart a spiritual gift that you might be established. I come today, last night, with a spiritual gift that I'm capable of imparting into others. You can't impart something you don't have yourself. And that spiritual gift on my life is divine favor. Amen. The 
favor of God. Gloria Copeland has told me for years, Jerry, I've never met anybody that experiences the favor of God more than you. It's, it's my gift. And, and the Lord showed me, I've had his favor on my life even before I came to him. All my life I experienced favor in one way or the other. And most people, and me included, thought it was luck. I was told all my young life, luckiest boy I ever met. You're the luckiest guy I ever met. And I thought it was luck. But the Lord showed me. He said, no, son, that was favor. I was preparing you for what you'd be walking in for the rest of your life. So I came here today with an assignment to make an impartation, not only in the word in your life, but lift up your hands. I stretch forth my hands toward you and in Jesus' name, I impart into you the favor of God at the next level. You already have it. You're already walking in it, but there's always another level. The Bible talks about growing in grace. And if you look in your new uh, Amplified Bible, grace is usually always translated unmerited favor. So if you can grow in grace, you can grow in favor. How many of you'd like to grow in the favor of God? Be it unto thee according to your faith. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. When you get back home, get ready, get ready. You're going to experience favor like never before. Give the Lord your best shout, hallelujah. Amen. Don't think that Amazon is the only one that has prime delivery. And how many times do we order, click the buttons, because we want something every day. I was telling somebody the other day, because I'll, I'll be on the road, and I'll just be on the road and click Amazon so that it's like Christmas when I get home. Why? Because I like stuff. I like stuff. And he loads us. And I said this last week. I said, God wants me to have something every day because he loads me daily with benefits. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his, all his benefits. What are they? Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. He redeems thy life from destruction. He crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies our mouth with good things, good words, so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. But that's not the end of the list. That is a list. But the end of the list, he lets you finish. Keep right. What does your faith call? And adds to that list. That you got that you that you're forgiven any given day that's a benefit. You're healed that's a benefit. That he gives you right words to say that so you can keep writing the benefits that receive every day. How many of you remember what Ed used to say? Anybody remember about it? I get care packages every day for my father careth for me. Amen. I get every day, every day, every day. Thank you, Brother Jerry. That was over the top, over the top. There's more. There's more. Don't leave it on the table. There's more. Well, you can be seated, and we're going to receive an offering. Brother Jerry, you can go ahead if you would like, but we're going to receive an offering to uh, be a part of the daily benefits. For Brother Jerry, how many of you know we received benefits just sitting and listening to the truths of God's Word? That's a benefit today, the, the truths of the Word that we heard. Amen. So we want to be a part of being a, a flow of the benefits back into his life and ministry through our giving. Amen. Through the seed that we sow. There's an offering envelope at your seat. And uh, if you're giving by cash, please take that offering envelope, fill it out for us completely so that we can properly receipt you for your giving. If you're, and if you need an envelope, raise your hand high until the ushers are able to see you and serve you. And then also, if you're giving by check, please make it payable to DM, Dufresne Ministries. Please don't make it payable to him. If you've already done it, that's fine. But it makes it easier for us and for him if we can just give him one check. Not anything that you give him, 
goes every bit to him and more. So don't think that anything's withheld and it won't get to him, get to him. It all gets to him. Amen. And so if you'll do that, then if you want to give by text, you can uh, text the word guest to the number on the screen, or you can give online, defrainministries.org slash give. And we say to those of you who are viewing, be a part of this. I know that you receive something and you want to, you want to, uh, if I could say this, be obedient to what God's word says, because God's word says, let him who is taught, let him con communicate or contribute. And so how many of you know that when we receive, we're not done until we've contributed to the one who taught us. Amen. And so that's scriptural. It's not scriptural to, to receive something, then walk away. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, while you're making that out, we want to remind you service times tonight. Uh, Dr. Bill Winston will be here. And he will be doing the three remaining services of this camp meeting. And so we're looking forward to it. And so tonight, 7 p.m., tomorrow, 10 a.m., tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Also, we want to remind you, for those who may need it, there's Spanish translation available for those who are attending the services. Uh, to get information on how to hook into that, go back to our information center that's out in the foyer, and they can tell you exactly what to do. And uh, we also want to remind you that today is the last worship training session with Brother David Ellis. Brother Tony will be there. Jacob, Jacob good to see you, man. Uh, we've adopted him. We like that man. And so um, we're just inviting those of you who want to be a part of that. Maybe you're part of your worship team and somehow you're part of the sound. Anytime you're part of the, what goes on, on the platform, you need to come and hear what is taught in these services. That's going to be an hour after we dismiss here. So it's about 10 after 1. Uh, plan on being back here in the sanctuary for that. And then, of course, we will have prayer school with Pastor Noel and Ruby Ramos in the youth room. That's for all those who can't sing. You can pray. <laughs> and maybe you can come back next time and sing. We'll see. <laughs> Depending on how well you pray. And... Um, <laughs> Then we want to remind you, today's Thursday, right? Uh, so tonight is double up offering night. What does that mean? Double up offering night means that whatever you want to give, you're going to double it. And you're going to come on. I want to give a quick update if I, if I can find through all my, my stacks of stuff in my purse. You know what it's like, ladies. It's like dig down into the, ever, the, the bottomless pit there. Um... I'd been meaning to do this before, but we'll do it today. At camp meetings, so many of you pastors became involved in what we titled the Eagle Team Projects. And that is um, what Pastor Craig and what Brother David Ellis introduced to you. That's, a, that's an offshoot uh, or a like thing of what Brother Copeland had in the past, which was his CX team. And that is that they would just be a part of giving into projects. So we wanted to give you an update. Those of you who were here, you will remember that. And so that this was in January that the Holy Ghost moved this way. And... Um, we had uh, amounts that were pledged. To date, what has come in total is $686,421. Amen. <laughs> largest, this is the largest that this ministry's ever received. I'm saying in, a ser in, in one series of offerings that's been received. And then also, uh, there, were, there was an amount pledged. And the remaining pledges that are outstanding, $673,000. So with the two, what has come in and what has been pledged, one point, over $1.3 million. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you say, well, what about that? Well, all I can say is this, is that I have had it in my heart about an airplane uh, since not long after my husband went home to be with the Lord because uh, I believe in restoration amen but when when God restores it's better amen and so we're 
leaving for that. You say, what steps are you making? Well, we're following the Holy Ghost on that. As he directs us, we do that. It could be that, and, and really what I have in my heart, uh, these, these funds, some of you, when you gave toward this in January, you designated it for the airplane. Anytime you designate it, that's what it goes for. But otherwise, others didn't designate it, but it's, it is still in the Eagle Team Projects account. What I have in my heart right now is to just hold it into that account for the airplane. I'm not, it's not all designated but toward the airplane, but I've just put it in there. I don't have a sense to direct it any other way right now if God told me to because we're going we're going on more networks uh, with Jesus the healer our daily broadcast then I would do that in fact I said to God I said God what about me just paying for upcoming television airtime out of that account and when I woke up one morning God says don't do that so that lets me know he wants me to leave what has been committed in January into the account for the airplane at this point. Amen. I, maybe God will direct us to an airplane. Maybe somebody will give us an airplane. But whatever, we have the money that we can, we don't have to wait. Because no matter what airplane you have or how it comes, it takes money to, to get that thing moving. And I so believe in the supply of God that will even meet before the manifestation comes up that he's just stocking the accounts, getting it ready. So it's not just inactivity toward it. We're just, we're just not moving and doing something with it other than how God's directing. Amen. And uh, if you were here, what was it? Monday night we talked about... Um, how God is taking Jesus the healer further on additional network that we're going daily on another network all through Africa, all through the UK, and we're going on daily. I said to I said to our staff, I've said I have recorded daily. Why would I go why would I do it weekly? I said so we're gonna pay for daily. And so y'all are a part of that. You're believing with that. What was it? Two hundred and now we're, we're talking about Faith Broadcasting Network. $260,000 is not all for that. It's for the airtime for all of the networks that we're on, okay? So we're just saying we're forecasting just the airtime. That's not production costs. That's just airtime costs. And so Pastor Debbie was sitting there, and she, she turned to me, and she said, you know, that's just 260 people giving $1,000, and the whole thing is done? That, that's so doable and so when we talk about these terms too many times we think of the whole but uh, the parts are so doable and so uh, we we appreciate how generous you are and um, one of the things that I like I said I, in, I I really brought it before God that I could take the Eagle team what has already been given and put it toward that he says no and he he said this do separately so that's what we're doing so I just wanted to update you where that was at and what kind of our thinking is toward that and just know this I am sober about everything that comes into our hands this is the giving of the people and I tell you what it's not treated lightly and I so appreciate it but I just wanted to update you on that amen hallelujah praise the Lord praise the Lord uh, we want to let you know we're going to be Ontario, Canada with pastors Craig and Jenny Field over here. I cannot tell you how many times I have called them Jenny Craig. I'm still accurate, but... <laughs> But we're going to be holding a miracle crusade in Georgetown, Texas, October. That's August the 27th. Let me. I got too many lines on this paper. Ontario, Canada, August the 22nd through the 31st. Then we're going to Georgetown, Texas, October the 15th through the 19th. You don't want to miss it. It's 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 unique. Uh, it's different than these conferences because the purpose is different. But uh, if you're going to be a part of that, please register and let us know you're coming. Then we're back here for another conference, for our ladies' conference, October the 3rd through the 5th. You say, who's all the speakers? You have to know that I, I, I'll let you know when I find out. 
And I, I, I'm this way. I don't care to plan a year in advance because God normally does not tell me a year in advance. And I'm, I'm really sensitive to just, I just don't want to go out there too far and, and just get something on the calendar and miss God's highest flow for us. But we do know that Pastor Debbie Simons will be here for that. Woo! She is our resident chainsaw. That's how she described herself, but we so love having her. So put those dates on your calendar, October the 3rd through the 5th. And we called it a ladies' conference, but we have men that drive their, their wives in here, men that come in with their, flying with their wives. You are so comfortable, and you are so welcome here. And we won't put you all in the back. We let you sit with your wife because no one else probably wants to sit with you that way. But no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But it's not just if, if men need to accompany their wives you are so welcome to attend because I'm, I'm not real good at, at, at gender sermons I, I, I'm not I, I try but it doesn't work and so uh, that's just an update of what's on the calendar and we'd love to have you come and join us are you ready to give this morning didn't you love that didn't you love that word hallelujah father we thank you for what we've received today we honor what we've received and we thank you father that we will not leave this place the same way we came in we're reaching for more and we're reaching for maximum and we thank you for it it belongs to us and as we give we release our faith together and we say we're letting you do it god we're letting you do it and everybody said Amen. Go ahead and pass the offering buckets. As that offering bucket goes your way, say this with me. Say, all the money that Jerry Sabell Ministries needs, it comes. All the money that this ministry needs, it comes. All the money that my church needs, it comes. All the money that I need, it comes. All the money that my business needs it comes and I'm letting God do it letting God do it does not mean that you're inactive it means you're still active with your faith talking about how he's doing it amen hallelujah after the offering bucket goes your way stand with us if you would turn to somebody before you're dismissed and say thank God I'm in the maximum flow and you can be dismissed we'll see you tonight Thank you.